Welcome back to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, on this side of the program, we're going to talk about uh, a number of things, including mandatory minimum sentences and actually the elimination of mandatory minimum sentences. And you may have heard or read about uh, a lot of that in the uh, newspaper over the last week or two. And our guest for this segment of the show is Senator Sonia Chang Diaz and Barbara Dugan. And we're going to talk to each one of them from their respective perches about um, why mandos, as we call them, mandos or mandatory minimum sentences, uh, really does not serve the purpose that they may have been intended to serve and why they should go away and then what replaces that. So without any further ado, ladies, thank you so much for Glad coming on. Right. Let me start with you, Senator. You recently filed a bill um, wherein you talk about the need to eliminate mandatory minimum sentences. Why did you do that? Well, so first to just give a, a broader overview, the bill does include, it's probably one of the biggest pieces of the bill, um, a repeal of mandatory minimums on nonviolent drug crimes. Mm -hmm. um, but it is not just that, it's intended to be a, an omnibus bill. So in addition to uh, repealing mando, man mans yeah. uh, on the drug crimes, uh, it also would repeal something that we call uh, collateral sanctions, which is the practice you and I have talked about this. Many mm -hmm. people are surprised to learn that we do this currently as a state um, where we revoke um, offenders' driver's licenses for up to five years after they've served their time, right. um, mm -hmm. even if their original crime had nothing to do with operating a vehicle under the influence or anything like that. Um, and it's a real barrier to people being able to re-enter the workforce mm -hmm. and be productive members of their community when they want to you know, re rehabilitate themselves and get back on track. So we would repeal that, um, also reduce um, some felonies to misdemeanors for minor crimes like shoplifting or mm -hmm. low-level mm -hmm. theft, mm -hmm. and then also institute um, extraordinary medical placement for people who are terminally ill, and they could be um, you know, kept safe uh, in terms of, you know, they're, they're not really a threat to society, um, but it could be um, under house arrest, for example, for a much lower cost than uh, than you bear, right. having them in the House of Corrections right. and that the taxpayer bears. Right. So that's the right. full package. And then we take the money that we would save from those reforms, put it right into a trust fund so it's dedicated, and then from that trust fund, spend that money out on proven solutions that we know work um, to prevent people from getting involved in the criminal justice system in mm -hmm. the first place mm -hmm. or recidivating us a second time. So these would be things like workforce development programs, mm -hmm. pre-apprenticeship programs, um, dropout prevention and intervention. So that this is a long way I'm getting back around to your question of right. why. Um, because you know I see over and over again, both at the level of data, uh, and analysis, but also individual human stories, people in my district who come to me in, in you know, just really tired frustration, and they yeah. say things like, Sonia, you know, there's one social worker who's shared among my child's school and 15 other schools in our city, and yet we're spending $47,000 a year to incarcerate somebody. Right. What is going on? You know, right. what, that's crazy backwards. And so this bill is really trying to recognize the backwardness of that spending allocation and flip it so that we're putting money into the prevention side, into the rehabilitation side, and not just you know, burning that money on incarcerating people without preparing them to re-enter. And Barbara, you work with Families Against Mandatory Minimum Sentencing. That's correct. From the standpoint of the families, mm -hmm. when you have a person that may have committed a crime, and the nature of that crime may garner realistically six months, maybe a year, but the law says they have to go away for five years at this $47,000 annually mm -hmm. to incarcerate them, what is the position of your organization? We uh, believe simply that uh, people should be sentenced according to what they did, mm -hmm. uh, what's needed to keep the, the public safe, and what's also needed to get them back on their feet as taxpayers and law-abiding citizens. I think it sounds pretty reasonable. I mean, the problem with mandatory minimums is that it's basically one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. sentences, depending generally, not always, but generally on nothing more than the weight of the drugs that a transaction involved. It has nothing to do with the role the person played. The person may have been the, you know, the, the ringleader who's going to get the money, or may have been the girlfriend who gave someone a ride or some intermediary. But everybody gets whacked with the same sentence, which just makes absolutely no sense in terms of what taxpayers have to shell out for these mm -hmm. policies, but also for getting pe holding them accountable, but getting them back into the mainstream where they can be productive 
neighbors and parents and members of our communities. Well, talk to us about the impact, though, that it does have on the direct impact that it has on families. When mom or dad is taken out of that family yes. unit and put away for a while in, in prison. Yeah, we have got many times it's the father uh, who's in prison, but not necessarily. There's mothers, too. There are so many sons in prison, but daughters, too. Um, and so you have the family unit broken up. I mean, oftentimes, if you are a single parent, your kids are going to go someplace else. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our members, uh, she's out now, thank goodness, but she, her husband died unexpectedly. She was, had two young children, and that's when her uh, substance abuse started. Not excusing it, but not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. And so when she got sentenced to 15 years for being in the next room when this drug deal went down, yeah. her young children had to go live with her elderly parents. It was hard on everybody. And I think we all know the statistics that children of incarcerated parents right. are more likely mm -hmm. to be incarcerated themselves. Right. So as the senator said, there's many other ways we can deal with people who have broken the law. We're not talking about turning a blind eye, but things that keep people uh, connected to their families, preferably their jobs, their communities, while they're getting the services they need and they're being held accountable for what they did wrong, but we're not withdrawing them from the family unit. I mean, there's not only the family unit, but this obviously weakens the fabric of an entire community mm -hmm. um, when so many people have been removed due to incarceration. So, Senator, let me ask you this. Last week, um, Mass Inc. had a forum around a number mm -hmm. of these issues and there was a very poignant moment between um, Judge Gans mm -hmm. and Suffolk County District Attorney mm -hmm. Dan Conley where they really were uh, vehemently opposed to this issue of mandatory minimum sentences with the judge saying that it's time that we mm -hmm. really need to look at doing away with this and the DA didn't agree with that. Have you had an opportunity to talk to either some of the justices or the DAs and What's your sense of whether or not we can bridge or they can bridge that divide? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, this is going to sound, you know, nerdy and wonky, but I think that um, data is, is, is going to be our bridge mm -hmm. if there's yeah, going to be yeah. one, right? That we really, as policymakers and as uh, members of the general public and as taxpayers, we need to be guided by, you know, what do the numbers really show us about mm -hmm. what's effective right. and what hasn't proven effective. And, you know, this is an issue that I wasn't always... Uh, involved in, I didn't, you know, come from an education background, uh, you know, sort of on the other side of the spectrum. And so when I first started to educate myself about the issue of mandatory minimums a few years ago, I really tried to call around and talk to folks in the law enforcement community and say, look, my district, you know, I represent um, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, Mission Hill, South Bend, Jamaica Plain, Rosendale High Park, you know, many of the communities across our whole state that are most impacted by violent crime and by the drug trade. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there was something, if mandatory minimums or anything else for that matter showed real, you know, discernible results in terms of reducing violent crime, reducing um, the, the vitality of the drug trade and making our community safer, right. I would be the first to give it mm -hmm. a serious look and to really credibly consider it. Um, but I have yet to talk to anyone who is able to show me that kind of proof. And in the absence of that kind of proof, and, but, but knowing what we know about how expensive it is um, to have these you know, long protracted sentences, the discretion that it takes away from judges, mm -hmm. whom we hire in order to exercise some judgment, you know, along with juries, about taking into consideration the particular circumstances of a case, um, and knowing what we know about the unequal impact of mandatory minimums in terms of um, the, the higher rates of incarceration that they are resulting in for communities of color. Mm -hmm. When you stack up all of those things on one side, right, and just the absence of evidence on the other side about these helping to reduce recidivism, reduce crime overall. It just, you know, to me, it's, and the fact that the communities that I represent, that again are most impacted by violent crime and the drug trade, mm -hmm. are crying out for reform in this area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. It just to me says, you know, there's, there's nothing to back up this policy. Let me ask you, let's take a, a bit of a deeper dive when you talk about being a little wonky. Um, explain to the audience how a bill actually moves through mm -hmm. the house. Mm -hmm. So you put a bill out there, you say, well, we think these are some good things that need to be addressed. Yeah. How long does it actually take to get in front of a committee or someone that can really effectuate some 
something, either yeah. change or not. How does that process work? Yeah, so we're going to go back to Schoolhouse Rocks here, right? right. I'm just a bill up on Capitol Hill. Right. <laughs> um, uh -oh. so, 20 words from us. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Um, the cliff notes. So I won't sing it, but... Um, so in a, in a nutshell, the process, uh, you know, officially is you file up. So we have a two-year legislative session. Okay. Right? This is the, we're elected for two terms. Right. So we file bills at the beginning of that two-year um, time. So that's this past January. Okay. Um, that's when I filed the Justice Reinvestment Act. And many other legislators, I should mention, have also filed um, different pieces and different versions right. of criminal justice reform. Okay. Um, Senator Ken Donnelly has filed a bill on bail reform, which has some really great provisions in it. Um, Senator Cindy Cream uh, has been a, a stalwart for years on mandatory mm -hmm. minimum reform. And I want to give credit. We basically just said, can we copy your language from mm -hmm. that bill mm -hmm. and put it into this omnibus bill? Okay. So there are several bills that are actually kicking around right now in the legislature on the topic of criminal justice reform. Those bills will likely all get assigned to the Judiciary Committee. So we break up the work by commit subject area, you know, judiciary, education, right, housing. Right. So these bills will all likely flow to the Judiciary Committee. Okay. Um, each bill get a, has a public hearing, uh, and that, that will get scheduled and announced publicly. So any member of the public, any stakeholder, um, you know, probably folks from the DA's community, hopefully you'll be there, I'll be there. Um, I'll be there. will yeah. come and be able to just offer testimony about um, what they think is wise about the bill, what they think is unwise about the bill, um, what could be, you know, what, what could be tweaked about the bill to make it better, mm -hmm. um, or just if they think it's terrible and ought to be thrown in the trash, whatever right. it is. Right. Um, and then the members of the committee will take that into consideration, plus any other research that they want to do on the bill, and um, ultimately the committee will make a recommendation to the full House and the full Senate about whether the bill ought to pass, ought not to pass, oh, or sometimes okay. it dies a quiet death by being oh, put yeah. into a study. <laughs> Um, and so we've seen that happen um, mm -hmm. in years past with some of with the mandatory minimums reform bill that had been kicking around for a long time, mm -hmm. um, and haven't made it to the full uh, floor of the House or the floor of the Senate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the big hurdle, I think, for us right mm -hmm. now. Um, but I'm encouraged. I, I hear a lot of um, interest. Uh, at a higher level than I have in years past, a re recognition. Uh -huh. It's not mm -hmm. a done deal by a long shot. This is still sure. going to be a big political lift. Yeah. Um, but more interest than I've heard in the past about, man, we really need to do something about our criminal justice system. The, the costs are spiraling out of control, and I'm not sure what we're getting in terms of mm -hmm. outcomes for it. So I'm encouraged that we'll get it to the floor, hopefully. Right. Um, and then there's a vote, and that's the part that people know more about, right? right. Is you have to get a majority senators or representatives, and then it goes back and forth between the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. and if it passes both chambers, it goes to the governor. Two-part question for you, Barbara. Now, in accordance with what the senator just mentioned about that process, mm -hmm. how does an organization like yours rally support to be some of the folks that may go to testify, sure, sure, uh, yeah. saying that this is a worthy build yeah. and, and, and we think that it really needs to have some teeth to it? And then the second part of that question is, what would you say to those folks who say, look, I don't know anybody in prison. I've never been in mm -hmm. prison. I don't have any friends or family in prison. Mm -hmm. Why should I even care? Mm -hmm. So let's start. Let's sure. talk about first, how do you rally support in, you know, mm -hmm. for a bill like right. one of the senators? Before I answer, I just want to give a shout out to Representative Benjamin Swan, yes. who is the House sponsor mm -hmm. of the mandatory minimum okay. piece of the omnibus Good bill. Man. From the western part of the state. Yes, yeah. who's always been another Fantastic. champion of this I'm issue. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, what we do is um, Families Against Mandatory Minimums, at least my job from in Massachusetts, is we track um, where the bill is at every stage of the process. Mm -hmm. We have a chart where we sort of simplified it to about 15 <laughs> steps. It's a complicated one. Right. And we um, are talking to people at every step of this of the process, okay. the behind the scenes work, but we also um, tell our members by way of email updates where the bill stands at every stage and at what points their input is needed. So at some points their own legislators may need to hear from them. At some point mm -hmm. it may be, let's mm -hmm. say, the Speaker of the House or the Senate President. Down the road farther, it might be members of what's called a conference committee when the House and Senate have passed different versions. Okay. Or we might target the governor if that's who needs to hear from us. But So there are places where people can, uh, and then there's like the public hearing where the public can show up, which is important, but I think almost more important that, for that is that um, people develop, if they don't already have it, a relationship with their own legislators mm -hmm. and let them know today, if not yesterday, where they stand on these Let's issues. Okay. So you don't have to wait for the big public hearing, which as we know can take mm -hmm. a long time and mm -hmm. will be there till the evening. 
but you can be weighing in with your legislators all the time about this. There's many different um, opportunities for you to tell them what you think. You can call them, set up a meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand they're very nice to talk to. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, people, we, we try and encourage folks to do that. We also try to educate the public uh, about what, uh, what these laws really are like when they play out with real people, real families. Okay. And that's why we collect the stories of real people who have been right. sentenced to just sometimes obscenely long sentences compared to this, the, the, what they, the crime they committed. The proportionality is just totally out of whack sometimes. So that's what we do among many other things. Mm -hmm. So now what do you say to the person that says, look, I don't know anybody in jail, I haven't been to jail, why should I even care about this? Why is this important to me? Well, because you're paying mm -hmm. for it. Uh, every taxpayer in Massachusetts is paying for f policies that frankly have not worked. I mean, mm -hmm. some people say, well, the opiate crisis is a reason to keep these laws. I would say if we, we might not have an opiate mm -hmm. crisis, but for mandatory minimum sentencing laws, which prevent judges from sending those drug offenders who need treatment to treatment. We're not naive, we know not everybody needs treatment, but you can't prevent it. So the general public, they're paying for these things, uh, these laws and policies. For, it's about $47,000 a year for a state prisoner now right. when you get uh, older or with health problems, right. it goes up about and 62, up. about 62,000. And I've heard you know, 75,000 know. Yeah, a year be, for people who are time. elderly and in these so-called right. nursing home units. Right. Um, so everyone's paying for these things. And if you don't like to pay a lot of taxes, you might think about this. Also, most everybody, especially drug offenders, they're going to be coming back home. That's right. They're going to be back in your community. Right. And why not bring them back healthier than when they went in. And maybe what they don't need is such a long sentence. You could maybe have a shorter sentence. I mean, some people may not need incarceration. Some people might. It might be appropriate. And again, we're not naive right. because you've got to hold people accountable. But give them that in addition to uh, the services that they're going to need when they get back to be healthy themselves or to at least lead a law-abiding uh, life, have a job, support your family. Right. And that makes entire communities safer. And healthier. Mm -hmm. Well, Senator, let me ask you this question because there are some that say that legislators, mm -hmm. um, and you know how much I love you, <laughs> that legislators, because of tough budgetary times, mm -hmm. had to take money out of what would have been available for more either dis discretionary programs, detox beds, mm -hmm. or mental health beds. How do we get that money put back in? So, speaking to your point, Barbara, if someone does something, they may need to be in a detox bed or mm -hmm. a mental health bed mm -hmm. and not in a jail cell. How do we as the collective get our legislators yeah. to really look at doing that? Yeah, so I think it, uh, two things here. One, I want to underscore something that Barbara said, which is so important and I think not said enough um, for, you know, for your viewers out there and anyone that they might know, that you don't have to go crazy, you know, re rearranging your schedule and come into a hearing. You know, it's, it's great. We love to have public mm -hmm. turnout and strong right. turnout at the hearing, um, but it's during the day usually and they're long. You have to wait around a lot. Um, and it's difficult for most people who have a job yeah, and, you yeah. know, have a regular life. Right. And it doesn't have to be that fancy, right? People can just drop us an email. Yeah. Right or just call mm -hmm. and say, "Hey, I live at you know one two three Maple Lane. Yeah. I live in your district. I vote in your district. Right. Even if you don't, you could say I plan to become a right. voter in your district. Right? right. 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 Um, <laughs> here's my email, and I would like an answer back. Right? right? Mm -hmm. Is Senator so and so or Representative so and so uh, going to co-sponsor the such and such bill? Sure. Or you know, right. can I count on him or her to vote for such and such bill? And well, just let me let me just ask you real quick. On your bill, did you get a lot of co-sponsors? We did, and it was okay. very. This is one of the things that um, you know makes me say I see more appetite than in the past. Uh -huh. But that's a low bar, <laughs> so uh -huh. you know we yeah. still have uh -huh. to get to a majority plus one right. in both chambers to get it passed. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of organizing work, and you know there's a reason that other states that are so-called red states have done We're reforms to yeah. their criminal justice yeah. system, yeah. right? And it's because of this money argument, yeah. right? Yeah. Where, where people are seeing these drastic cuts to other parts of the state budget that people really care about. They want to see right. education yeah. investments. They right. want to see substance abuse beds right. Right. equal to the need. And we have to figure out a smarter way to spend our money if we want to be able to get to yes on those things. And the red states are leading the way. Once
once again, principally fiscal because fiscal yeah. responsibility, not because yeah. they think it's the right thing to do. Well, you know, sometimes, I don't want to speak to people's sometimes. intentions, okay. but you see, you know, you see folks like Newt Gingrich and the Koch brothers yeah. starting mm -hmm. to lead the charge nationally mm -hmm. on criminal justice mm -hmm. reform. Yeah. And you know, it is my theory that that is a lot driven by issues of fiscal management mm -hmm. um, and cost, and that's fine. You know, we can we can have an alliance of. Uh, people who are doing it for civil rights reasons, people who are doing it for cost reasons, all of these are good reasons um, to point us toward criminal justice reform. The conservatives are often more interested in it, not only because of cost, but because of the high rates of recidivism. I mean, yeah. they're crazy. Yeah. Um, and if your idea is that you should only put money into programs that work, we, the conservatives mm -hmm. uh, are often in the forefront of saying, we've been giving uh, the criminal justice system a free pass here. We've poured, you know, incredible amounts of money into it with sometimes not even tracking results, or when we do, they're fairly dreary. So if we're going to be spending this money, let's do it in a way that we get some good results from mm -hmm. it. Well, going back to your point about um, evidence-based data, mm -hmm. you know, that speaks to mm -hmm. what does and what does not work. Let me ask you this. The, I say so-called, but the war on drugs, mm -hmm. has it worked? In your estimation, you know it, this is where it gets a little bit past my uh, my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, uh, at, the more I have learned, um, and taking mandatory minimums as a good example, or um, the uh, the collateral sanctions where they take away people's licenses, right. um, you know, each new each or old tactic, I guess I should say that I have learned about a new. Uh, so far, I I see a real absence of demonstrated results, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And again, it's this, I don't think Democrats should give up, uh, should, you know, should sort of cede this ground that we don't yeah, care about yeah, that too, yeah. but conservatives have branded themselves mm -hmm. on this, um, you know, sort of pay for performance and results mm -hmm. driven and, uh, you know, yes, we ought to be looking for results. Right, right. And, I, and I think many of the policies do not prove it. So, uh, Barbara, the senator used the word vote twice in her last uh, comment. You know, the funny thing to me about, and nothing's funny about it, the elimination of civics in our public school systems and our school mm -hmm. systems, mm -hmm. you take away that ability for our youth and others to really understand how government and community works together, work together. Do you talk to your folks to say, as you, to the point that you were making, call your legislators, drop them an email, drop them a letter, and then also say, once again, the election is coming up. Uh, we vote, mm -hmm. and we want our voice to be heard. Do you go there, or do you try to keep it strictly on the issue that you're talking well, about? Well, we keep it... Uh Pretty strictly on the issue as a, a nonprofit, there's certain constraints oh, about right. what you I can do you. in terms of okay. um, looking at who's voting for what. But we did something we had never done before this fall. Um, we did polling of the candidates to see where they stood on the issue, and then we released a report to oh, okay. give our mm -hmm. members that information. Uh -huh. We cannot say vote for right. so and so or not. Right. But it was amazing. I mean, how many, the, just the tide has changed so much on this. And we got good support, uh, or at least people said they supported change, reform, if not outright repeal, um, from uh, the, I, I forget the exact details, but probably two-thirds of the candidates who ended up in the final election. Nobody no matter what their party was, um, was in favor of making uh, mandatory minimums longer or cre creating more of them. Okay. It was, the, the differences between some people said, well, let's keep them where they are, and, but more people said, no, 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 we need to be moving on to something better. Right, and do you have a something better out there that could be done? Well, what we say, I mean, we don't have a position on um, necessarily sentencing guidelines in Massachusetts. That's a tricky issue. Um, it's not as clear cut as people might think. But basically what this would mean is the judiciary gets to do what it does in most other cases. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. talking about Civics 101, one of our basic pillars of democracy is that we have an independent judiciary. Mm -hmm. We've got you know the executive branch, law enforcement, the legislative branch, right. And then the judiciary. Right. Um, so we would simply be asking them to make informed decisions about what sentence is appropriate, as they do in many, many other cases mm -hmm. that don't require mandatory minimum sentences. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I have to stop you here. But what I'd like to do, both of you, if folks want more information about what it is that you're doing, your cause and mm -hmm. your cause, how do they get in touch? How do they get uh, more information? Our organization is FAM, Families Against Mandatory Minimums, F-A-M-M dot org. Mm -hmm. Go to our website, and 
look for the Massachusetts section, or they can contact me at B Dugan, B D O U G A N, mm -hmm. at fam.org. Senator? Uh, website or email are probably the easiest. Uh, so on our website, you can find out more information about the legislation, and you can also sign up for our email list so you can get action alerts about you know, updates on mm -hmm. what's going on with the bill. Um, so that's Sonia Chang Diaz, all one word, no hyphen, mm -hmm. S O N I A C H A N G D I A Z mm -hmm. um, dot com. Uh, I'm sorry, Senator Chang Diaz. Mm -hmm. The first one was a campaign website. <laughs> Senator Chang Diaz dot com. Again, no right. hyphen. Right. Um, and then the email address is Sonia dot Chang hyphen Diaz at masenate.gov. Beautiful. Ladies, thanks so much for coming on. We're going to follow well, this issue, yeah. and we'll probably have you back again, you know, as yeah, this so. thing tracks through, you know, the, the, the 15 or 16 or 20 steps that you said it's going to take. 104. You know, Don't make then, it sound that complicated. Okay. Just, just email your legislator. We've done it before. We'll do it again. Yeah. We've done it before. We'll do it again. There you go. Well, thanks so much for coming on and educating us about Great. this. Thanks okay. so much. All Thank right, you. folks, that's it. We're out of time. We're out of here. We'll be back again next week. So until then, you take care of yourself. We'll see you soon.